destroyed around a hundred billion dollars off of markets on Friday. We're gonna talk about China. We're gonna talk about the car crisis, used car market right now. It's gonna be a fun call. This is a live stream today. So drop comments if you'd like. Please like this video, promote it if you can, uh, and we'll get this thing rolling. So first off, let's actually just pull up the transcript. Very interesting actually uh, on this. So Jerome Powell typically comes and gives a speech and he sometimes reads the speech, sometimes gives the speech, but most times reads the speech, but then he answers questions, gives you insights on what he was saying in his speech. Now, this time he just read an eight minute speech and he got off stage, no Q and a nothing there, which is I think a little bit interesting. Um, you you kind of wish they would just speak from the heart, but again, people really read into people, their words. And so essentially they want to write them out. So here they are. He read this exact uh, speech here. Um, and to summarize, it was actually quick. You guys can read it or listen to it. Um, very quick speech being very hawkish on the central bank's job and role to curb inflation. A lot of tough talk from Jerome Powell that their goal is to curb inflation, that they want to, it's and he said in his own words, let's see if I can find it here, that it is going to be pain. Okay. They will bring some pain to households and businesses. There are unfortunate costs of reducing inflation, but a failure to restore price stability would mean a far greater pain. A few months ago, soft landing, Nothing soft about this, right? There's a lot of pain apparently coming and they delivered. Jerome Powell said, we're going to have some pain. Pain happened Friday. Huge market sell-offs. Today, following, or Monday, kind of even a little bit lost. And today, a huge, I guess we can pull up some tickers here. As of right now, it's 104 my time. And so that's three o'clock Eastern. Um, SMP down 1.27. Dow uh, dropping 349 points again today, another percent. NASDAQ down a full percent. Russell 2000, where's that down 1.6. So about a percent and a half off today. Um, but, uh, you know, big changes here. Apple going to their big announcement, their iPhone next week down um, 1.5, AMD 1.8. Um, and just moving down a lot of blood going on. People repricing in these hikes. Now, sounds like they are going to, he says right here, we're going to, um, we want to return. He hasn't said this in a long time. We want to return back to 2%. Remember last year when they were saying, we want to have it well above 2% to have a 2% long-term average. Well, apparently we are way well beyond the 2% and now we want to get back to a 2% long-term average there. And there's a lot of tough talk in this conversation, a lot of pain coming forward for uh, this. Now they uh, have the target to do a 75 basis point, which they did in July. Um, our decision in September meeting will depend on total of incoming data and uh, evolving outlook. A lot of people are pricing in a, a 50 a, 0.5 or 50 basis point rate hike in September. Um, and uh, all this, all this does is again, this is their effort to curb inflation, right? Which is, you know, rightfully so. And he, he, I, you know, since asking for just a year ago was stronger monetary policy. Wanted someone to come in and clean this up. We've had such a loose monetary policy for the last three years. Some tight monetary policy might be good. Now, is it too little too late? I don't know. Um, he says, again, it is going to be a painful uh, right here. Lot of this is going to be painful for households and businesses, but it is necessary. Anyways, a lot of tough talk in this conversation. Obviously, markets uh, pricing this in. I'm going to try to stop sharing here. Let's see if I can do that. So pricing in what's going on, which is anyways, kind of interesting. Now, let's put this into real world consequences of what this means. Now, he says in the talk as well, we will use all tools at our disposal. Now, the Fed has a number of different tools. A few of them they've already started to play with actually all, most of them. They've already exhausted in some ways, <laughs> but a couple of things they are doing right now. They, uh, in June started doing bond, uh, issuances and buybacks. So they changed it. Um, but so right now they're issuing bonds, 80 billion a month right now is their bond issuance. What does that mean? So when they issue a bond, they actually take out, you're paying for that bond. So they take money from you and it takes money out of the money supply. They essentially give you a piece of paper in exchange for your dollars. And it takes money out of the money supply. Okay. Uh, additionally, that's one of their tools. Um, they can set the bit most popular one is interest rates. So they started to raise interest rates in June, July, um, and they tried to raise rates. And uh, again, they want to do it now. So target rate, he says right here, is puts it about 2.5, 2.75 is their target rate. Um, what does that mean for everyday households? So right now I am, I have to, I got a, I bought a property earlier this year. I've got to refinance out of a private money loan into a traditional mortgage. I just got quoted this morning, 7.15% for my mortgage. It's about a 
$10,000 house. My average monthly payment's going to be with taxes and all that stuff. It's going to be about 300 and three, excuse me, $3,200. So 3,000, about $200 I will pay for a $500,000 house. Very interesting. Okay. A year, two years ago, same property, same size. I'm paying 1600, 1700. Now it's 3,200, almost double what it was two and a half, three years ago uh, for rates. Okay. That is how much you are paying for prices. Now, because of that, most people buy a property based off of the mortgage payment. If you wanted to get the same mortgage payment, I saw a guy online, they do this, this math. He's like, if you want to do the same payment as you would have gotten uh, uh, two years ago, the price of a $500,000 home would have to be $345,000 today, assuming a 6% rate. I'm getting a 7% rate because seven and a half because it's a rental property. Um, that's the price. If you had an equilibrium, that's where it would be for people to buy that, that home with the same payment. Very interesting, right? With you have <laughs> with uh, with um, how to reprice homes. So right now, obviously, you're seeing declines in pretty much all markets. Um, directly affected by interest rates would be a car market, would be a housing market. But also, I think people underestimate the use of interest rates not just on homes or cars, but across the entire economy. Businesses use a lot of debt. Businesses will take out a line of credit to go buy inventory from Shanghai or Cambodia or China or whatever it is. They maybe they're going to buy. They were last year they would have bought a hundred thousand shirts. Uh, they're you know designed. They're going to buy shirts, clothing, whatever. Now because their debt service is so high, they're only going to buy fifty thousand shirts because they got to pay more for that capital. Cost of capital goes up. You get strained a little bit. You can't do as much as the business expand as quickly um, as well. This affects every single business on essentially on planet Earth. Um, then you know whether it's your business or a supplier of your business, things start getting tighter. So um, again, a lot of tough talk from Jerome Powell. Market's trying to reprice this in. Now, crypto has been interesting. So let me pull up crypto um, here. Very interesting. So crypto took a dive over the weekend. Our fund actually, we bought up a ton of juicy stuff over the weekend. We were very excited. Um, here's coin market cap. Let's just look at uh, today. Today, though, quite a reversal. Um, and uh, yesterday, with Ethereum up 3%, Bitcoin up 1%. So a little bit of gain, but still below $20,000. Broke through that $20,000 threshold again. I have this false bull rally as of recent. So pretty interesting. Ethereum um, has been just all over the place. Let's see if we can just see this chart here. Um, yeah, Ethereum has been now. Ethereum's got a few different things going for it. Let's go to let's go to the month chart. So uh, peaked the last month, almost two thousand dollars, right above two thousand there. And then today, you know, over the weekend, had some some pretty adjustments. Then a pretty you know good little run up here, and then now back repricing. So now Ethereum's got Ethereum 2.0 coming out sometime in the future. Vlad is very behind that. So Ethereum's very interesting um, play right now. Let's look at Bitcoin though. Huge drop off, right? <laughs> major major sell off. Um, this is this morning. Boom, all the way down uh, in the green as of yesterday. Did kind of well, anyways. Um, People, again, repricing in all sorts of stuff. Um, you can see this across most markets, though, right now um, of this uh, bearish activity. Now, what's interesting about this and what Powell says, let me go back to Powell's speech here. Um, okay. He says this, which I think is very interesting. Now, this could be the other side of the coin. If the public expects inflation. Oh, wait, let me zoom in. You guys can see this better. Here we go. Boom. Let me go down. All right. If the public expects that inflation will remain low and stable over time, then absent major shocks, it likely will. Unfortunately, the same is true of expectations of high volatile inflation during the 1970s. As inflation climbed, the anticipated of high, the anticipation of high inflation became entrenched in the economic decision making of households and businesses. The more inflation rose, the more people came to expect it remained high, and they built that belief into wage and pricing decisions. As former chair Paul Volcker, who was in the 1970s, did this. He broke the back of great, the great inflation. 1979, inflation feeds in part of, on itself. So part of the job of returning to a more stable and more productive economy must be to break the grip of inflationary expectations. Pretty interesting. So in this talk, he talks about breaking the back of inflation and ways to do this, but also breaking the expected inflation. Now, people, I would argue people today are way more financially literate than they were in the 1970s or 80s, especially with YouTube and content like you're watching right now. Okay. Case in point, you're listening to some kid tell you about all this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, 
you the average survey, I think it was 65% of Americans believe we were in a recession last month. And, uh, and most believe we're in high inflationary times. In fact, actually had been following the inflation number very quickly. Um, most people back in the 80s kind of got the concept of it, but weren't following the numbers, following the CPI. People today are, I think, way more financially literate than they were back then. And so I think what Powell's trying to do here is say, you know what? We need to break expectations. We need to break uh, the back of inflation. Now, the big question comes down to what will they actually do? Will they actually all this tough talk with inflation, will they actually follow through with it? Now, as far as next month, I think they will. I think they will raise rates by 50 basis points. Let's call it, who knows exactly the number, but let's call it 50 basis points. Um, and maybe if we get another lower CPI number, that might be enough. And a lot of tough talk. Usually you have a lot of tough talk when you don't have anything backing it, right? That's what you do. A lot of tough talk in this thing. Maybe there's not much backing it for what he wants to do. Um, I don't know. A lot of people are trying to price in. I've, I've, it's so funny. I, I sit down and listen to a lot of people. So I just, I mentioned a lot of bearish things about the market, things that are going down. It's bad. We're going to have this painful time period. I also hear very bullish things from people. So it's funny. You do all this research and you end up with both. I'll share some bullish things. I've talked to some stock guys. Uh, they're saying we're going to see all time highs by Q1 and Q2 of next year. All time highs in the stock market. There's all this capital that's selling off but where's it going to go? Yeah, some of it obviously goes to pay back old debts, maybe, but maybe it's just sitting on the sidelines and people are going to say, you know what, we got to get back in because things are still, inflation is still happening. There's asset inflation and real inflation. We need to get back in the markets. And um, the other thing that's bullish is uh, the election. Right now we have midterms. Biden just essentially did, <laughs> so funny. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, I try not to criticize politicians, uh, you know, directly, but it's just interesting that Biden comes out and says, we're not in a recession. We've got a great economy, a great labor market. We've got the best economy ever. We're not in a recession, even though we've had two quarters of economic decline, we're not in a recession. However, a month later, they use executive powers, an executive order, because we're in an emergency an economic emergency to forgive student loans, 10, 10 or $20,000. If you make under $125,000, uh, you can qualify for these loans, which is a very inflationary thing to do. And he's doing it by the powers of we're in an emergency. We're in an economic emergency here. And it's an executive order that I need to do this. Congress didn't pass that. Other people didn't pass. That was an executive order. And so it's like, dude, what story are you telling? We have the greatest economy ever. Apparently it's not in a recession, but also it's so bad that we need to forgive student loans and bribe voters to vote Democrat in November. I think it's very uh, inconsistent from the, the White House and Central Bank together. Uh, if we had such a great economy, you wouldn't need to do this. Now, the people, what people don't understand is you give away those student loans, okay? 10 or $20,000 forgiven. That is, that goes back and whether they're forgiven or back up, you know, people feel this less of a burden. They're not making payments. We also aren't, there's a moratorium on making payments for student loans. What does that do? It gives the consumer more capital in their pocket. And what do they do? They then, because they have more capital, they can bid up scarce resources. So it's uh, on the demand side of inflation. They have supply side and demand side of inflation, which they talk about. So the, the supply and demand curve, I'm going to use my hands here, <laughs> but they've been saying this for the last two years. We have supply side inflation, meaning it's not because we printed money that there's inflation. It's because we can't, uh, through COVID, we couldn't ship stuff. And so because we can't ship stuff, there's only so many consumers bidding on scarce resources. And because they're bidding on them, they, they get bid up. And that's why prices are going up because there's less supply of certain goods, which makes sense. The other side though is demand side inflation. Meaning maybe there's just as many iPhones as there was before or products, or whatever on eBay. Think about eBay and eBay auction, same number of products, but the consumer has more money to spend and they're going to bid up homes. They're going to bid up cars. They're going to bid up pretty much any other asset class there is. They're going to bid them up because they have more money in their pockets to bid them up. Hence you have inflation. Okay. Um, so supply side, demand side inflation. Um, and actually Jerome Powell talks about this in his speech um, that central banks that they are now, people are pricing in a long-term inflation forever. They've been saying it was transitory. They were denying it. And now they're saying we're, people are, we're pricing in long-term inflation and it's the job of, Central banks around the world. This is your job to curb inflation and have a standard inflationary measure. Um, 
it's uh so anyways finally admitting what they're at and anyways a lot of tough talk here on friday again markets repricing this in um uh he says this, when inflation is persistently high, households and businesses must pay close attention and incorporate inflation into their economic decisions. Let me just share my screen here so you can see it. Can you see it there? There we go. Boom. Um, one, oh, one useful insight is how in actual inflation may affect expectations about its future path is based on the concept of rational in attention. When inflation is persistently high, households and businesses must pay close attention and incorporate inflation into their economic decisions. When inflation is low and stable, they are free to focus on their attention elsewhere. Former chair and Alan Greenspan put it this way, for all practical purposes, price stability means that expected changes in the average price level are small enough and gradual enough that they do not material enter businesses and household financial decisions. Which is, I think, I think this was. A, by the way, I I actually liked this talk a lot. I think I think it was really good. I wish we had a Q and A to talk about it, but I I like the tough talk. I like. We'll see if he backs it up. That we need to put a grip on inflationary uh, expectations here, and then actually, um, let me scroll up a little bit. Central banks. He says the first lesson is that central banks can and should take responsible responsibility for delivering low and stable inflation. Man, it's been a long time to get him to say this. I mean, <laughs> but again, I, I think I, uh, I, uh, it's funny. I, my dad, um, has, uh, taught me this and I love this concept. He gives this analogy of the dumb waiter. And I love this analogy because it makes a lot of sense. Now I I've criticized a few things about the fed here and all this stuff, but I want to summarize this in a, in one analogy that I think is very, uh, important for everyone to understand with politics, with government, with big organizations. So this is the example. This is my, my dad. By the way, my dad runs, you know, co-founder of a huge, massive fund, just recently retired. He spoke at our last event. He's a brilliant, brilliant dude. And uh, he says this, he says, Bridger, imagine we're at a restaurant and let's say Bridger, I'm a waiter, you're a waiter. And we are doing, we do tips every night. We're doing change. We're giving out stuff. And I, Bridger, I'm just an idiot. I just, I'm really bad at change. I'm bad at math. I have a hard time getting the correct change. People give me a 20 and I always give them the wrong change. And people over the course of a year, all the other people that work at the restaurant, like you guys are like, man, Bridger's just, he's just bad at math. You tell me, sorry, this guy, he's just bad at math. And just, he's a little slow. We'll get you the right change. You always fix the change for me and stuff. And I say, okay, yeah, thank you so much. And, and all that good stuff. Okay. I'm just bad at math. However, we do an audit of my last 100 transactions where I got the change wrong, where I messed up the change. You audit my 100 transactions, you find out that 95% of those transactions, I gave the change wrong, but it was in my favor. It actually benefited me. I took away a little bit more money. And because because it should be 50-50, 50% 50 of the time it's more to the customer, 50% of the time it's more to me, but 95% of the time it's more to me. And you look at this audit and you go, huh, is Bridger really bad at math? Or are we the idiots for believing that he's bad at math? Who's the real idiot? Are you the idiot or am I the idiot? Because I do the change and I end up taking home more money every single night because I'm bad at math and no, I can't do the change right. Am I the idiot or are you the idiot for believing me when I told you I was bad at math? Okay, does that make sense? So I think this is a great analogy for the Fed, central banks, the White House, whoever it is. They say stupid stuff. All the time. And it's like, there's a blatant thing. Let's just talk about it. It's obvious. Are we, are they the idiots? We go, and people online criticize, man, Jerome Powell's such an idiot. Doesn't know what he's doing. The White House, blah, blah, blah. Are they the idiots though? Or are we the idiots? They have the most resources on planet Earth, most economists. And they've got thousands of people working for them. Giving them data and all the stuff, all the resource, all the information, most you know, informed people on planet Earth. Are we the idiot or are they the idiot? Now, I understand they say one thing and they'll do something else. I get it. But you got to look into what are they actually doing and trying to accomplish. And these are the smartest people on planet Earth. Okay, these are, are really, I, I really think, not the smartest, but some of the smartest, most informed people on planet Earth. I really hesitate when people just call them an idiot outright. <laughs> they're not idiots. They are smart. Now they might sound dumb, 
but they probably have a deeper plan or deeper agenda, in my opinion. So with that being said, I think Jerome Powell's tough talk, a lot of good talk. I, I think it's some repricing just happened. I think they're going to raise rates next month. However, I don't know. I think they're trying to have tough talk so that people like us discuss and say, you know what, they're, they're, they are breaking the back of inflation. And I could see this right before midterm elections, uh, early November, we have broken the back of inflation. We accomplished it. We, we've, you know, we had this big monster and the, the current administration, the current people, we did it. I could totally see that. And having this public campaign, inflation's coming down. It's been awesome. And rolling right into the midterm elections. Could you not see that? Right now? Um, anyways, I, I could go on and on about scenarios, but I just think I, I could see this happening in the midterms, this tough talk of inflation. They want to break the expectations of inflation, like I mentioned, and hopefully the real, real inflation that is really actually happening that they denied all of last year. Now they're admitting it and maybe they can break the back of inflation in a couple months, you know, and uh, we're back to all time highs by Q2 of next year. That totally could happen. Um, and, and maybe the other side of it is that they don't break the back of inflation. Or they go, they go, they have to really work hard at it. And it puts our economy into a, like he says, a painful period where we hit bottom and bottom and bottom and bounce and are in a deep recession uh, early next year. So I, uh, the, the picture can be painted both ways. I think it's very interesting. Um, what can happen? Now let me pull up the chat. I want to hear from you guys a little bit. Um, what do you guys think? Uh, what do you think happens to crypto during a recession? I have no clue, uh, to be honest. I can give you my opinion though. Um, it's funny. I think people that give predictions, I just think are usually just anyways, but I'll give you probabilities. I think crypto we've seen over the last year has been a very closely associated with the current big tech stocks, right? Um, that's, you know, that's, that's, what's been going on now with crypto though. It's, it's interesting. I personally, um, I crypto could be manipulated by the U S government and the fed. Um, I think that's total possibility, total pop possibility. And they want to keep it in a cage while they build their own uh, currency there. Um, again, I don't know how it would perform. Uh, individual cr crypto is a, in general, though, as a whole blockchain technology, I believe, regardless of recession, will be on the rise. There are one in, I was speaking with Kevin O'Leary on stage uh, two months ago, and he, he brought this up. He said one in four developers are going into blockchain technology. One in four coders, programmers coming out of school, moving jobs are going into blockchain and Web3. One in four. You don't get one in four of something of engineers going to an industry and not really good products come out of that. Usually people, things happen, right? It grows like crazy. So one in four uh, software engineers going into blockchain and Web3, I think is crucial. And we're going to get some really amazing tech coming out of the blockchain space, I believe over the next couple of years. So with that backing it as a real thing, now the price of it is just buyers and sellers, but the backing technology will add actually, actually great, you know, companies in tech that use crypto or have a coin that's issued. I think that's utility based coins are awesome. How is of the unicorn fund doing? We just posted about it uh, yesterday. Actually, the uh, August 30th report just came out. Um, we just published our results since August 30th. I'll show you right here. Here it is. You guys can go to my Instagram, and check it out. Since August 30th, Bitcoin is negative 24.86%. This is as of August. So it's June 1st, August 15th when we started. Ugly Unicorn was positive 3.48%. So we beat Bitcoin by something like 28, 29%. We beat Bitcoin. Huge gap. In how we, how we beat Bitcoin. So this is pretty cool. We, uh, we've done very well. We're positive right now as for our fund, uh, Bitcoin's on a cliff. It was on a cliff since we started and we've done really well. So we're very excited. Um, so would you think buying the dip is a good or bad idea? Um, I'll just tell you what I do uh, right now. I have been, I have been buying this entire year. Every time stuff drops, I buy, I buy, I buy. I don't know when the bottom little moment, the correct moment is to buy. I've bought all year. I dollar cost average into a lot of stuff. Cause I just don't know the exact day to buy it. Whenever there's a big sale day though, a big red day. Yeah. Let's buy some, let's scoop some up. Uh, I bought a real estate property this year. Um, I bought one last December. Um, well, I might even buy one by the end of the year again, another, another real estate property, uh, stock market. I've been buying, uh, lots of equities, um, lots of indexes throughout this year. And our fund, ugly unicorn, we've bought a lot since, uh, since June, every red day we buy, we buy a ton. We've had limit orders and we just buy, 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 we buy the bottom and we stake them and we earn yield, um, on them. 
we're not a long short fund. We're not trading every day, but we buy just, we buy good dips. So um, when's the dip the best day? I don't know. It's funny. Kevin O'Leary as well on, uh, on stage. And I talked to them. He just, he said this, he, cause everyone asked him about a recession. He goes, man, everyone is so certain we're in a recession. Everybody, everyone I talk to is hundred percent. I talked to my lady that cuts my hair, the grocery store guy. They all, we're all in a recession apparently. And he goes, I just, the fact that everyone's calling a recession just makes me not want to think we're in a recession. So uh, now are we going to have repricing markets for sure? You have interest rates rising like crazy. Uh, real estate is already being repriced. Cars are already being repriced. Uh, businesses, some businesses are, are kind of in the middle on repricing. Uh, you know, they were now inflationary pressures. Now they're hitting deflationary pressures and kind of ends up in the equilibrium, which is the, what the Fed wants. Um, and uh, so now we might have a China debt crisis happening. If you guys watch, I put a video out last week on the China debt crisis. I think it was, I think it's, I still watch that every single day. I think that could be a, now. So economy like we're in right now, I think can be pretty level up or down, kind of just moves in waves until there's a black, what they call a black swan event or moment. So if you guys have ever heard that concept, it's just this moment that no one predicted that just like the Lehman Brothers was a black swan event. We, no one predicted the Lehman Brothers were going to collapse. And then all of a sudden, everyone tri it triggers all these other things. China debt crisis could be a huge black swan event right now, triggering a major windfall through all property development in China, bond holders of Chinese companies. Um, right now, the U.S. is looking at now auditing to delist a bunch of Chinese tech stocks. I, I think the Chinese economy could come crashing down by the end of the year could be a big black swan event and with that happens it catalysts everything else that's on the fence down as well so as of as of right now yeah i see this rocky going on but if there's a black swan moment which is it's a cliche of me to say like if there's a crazy thing i think that thing could be china another big black swan event could be the used car market right now andre jick put out an incredible video on used car the used car market go check it out um very very cool um, what he put out, I'll give him a huge shout out. I think it was a cool video talking about, I'll kind of explain it to you though. Um, uh, he says, uh, I think it's one, I think it's 12% of all cars right now are, are 30 days past due their payments. That's like, that's like tripled over the last three months. Uh, in New York, it's about 25% of all cars are in default in New York. Utah, actually the state I'm in is the lowest state. It's about 4% of cars are in default. People are not making payments on their cars. Uh, they're going up like crazy as defaults and repo companies that are repossessing cars are through the roof. They're busier than they've ever been. Um, I think it's going to be crazy. From whom to raise your first PE fund, specifically an ESG domain. Um, there's a lot of groups that want to raise. Um, it's probably a longer conversation, but we in our black card group, so that's our top coaching group. We have a bunch of people doing ESG funds, big institutions, family offices, uh, um, tons of different capital allocators are wanting to deploy into ESG. Now make sure what you're doing is actually ESG. Don't, don't do other create like off the side stuff make sure you're actually doing ESG and it qualifies. They've, they've made it more strict to qualify as an ESG based fund. Um, but really cool. There's a lot of people. We have placement agents, all sorts of people that we connect you with to try to get you in to people that want ESG funds. Yeah. Are the private equity markets getting taken off right now or waiting with cash to buy in this year, or early next year? Uh, in my, at least my experience with people in private equity um, and VC, some are getting their teeth kicked in and others are so excited. Finally, prices are coming down a little bit. It's a little more normal of a market. I see a lot of private equity deal uh, companies actually very excited and doing more deal flow right now and, and not maybe not right now, but activity happening with plans to close on deals end of year into early next year. Um, it's a lot of dry powder. I think it's like, it's like $500 billion of dry powder in private equity, meaning it's capital that they can deploy. Um, I think for a lot of uh, managers last two years, like, man, it's just so high. It's so high. I can't deploy. And now things have come down. They've repriced and finally they feel like they, okay, we can buy now. And so what, what happens is all this money still flows in and it, everything does great. So the other thing that's a, a bullish indicator, I, I'm going bearish. This is so funny. I go bearish and bullish, bearish and bullish. And I end up in the middle. A bearish indicator, or bullish indicator, so a good indicator for uh, the real estate markets, an up indicator. So many cash buyers. All these cash buyers are coming uh, to the table. You had a huge home shortage and still cash buyers are at the table. So they're still buying, still scooping up. Even with interest rates going up, it really just prices out people that are poor and people that need a big mortgage. 
but the cash buyers that still need rental properties, still need depreciation, all that kind of stuff are still buying. And so that's the other thing. It's like, Hey, yeah, it's going to, yeah, it's going to slow down. Things are going to become more normal, but it's not going to collapse, right? It's not going to fall to the floor. It's just going to reprice a little bit. So anyways, it's just funny how you go back and forth on economic data. What kind of fun can I start off with? Not much experience. So great, great question. I would say if you want to get in the fund game, go learn everything you can about funds. We have a free course. I'm going to put it below on this link. It'll go get our free course. Learn about funds. We have another course that's $2,000 called our Mastermind Core Program. It's, I think it's awesome. It's got 200 videos. Just learn. Learn all you can. And then be around other people running funds and hear what they're doing. Get insights and, and ideas from what they're doing. And maybe you'll just partner with one of them. Or you'll get an idea of like three or four different funds. You go, oh man, I could do an in-between. And we talk about blue ocean and red ocean strategy. You have a blue ocean opportunity where you're doing arbitrage, a true blue example, something like that. And you can come and really grab a, have an awesome fund. So um, I would first learn is my first, what I tell people, just learn, learn the game. This is a long game, the world of funds. It's not a get rich quick scheme. Okay. This is a long-term game. Come and educate and learn everything you can about yourself. So watch my videos. Uh, go, we have a free course. We have an updated, uh, a bigger course. If you guys want to get that one. And then if you want to join our, like in person, we have our black card group. So our black card groups are top tier group. You get to come, we're actually going to Mexico next month and, uh, we're gonna have a fun time. We're, we're in person. We get to hang out. We do all sorts of fun stuff. We have 15 coaches that give you ideas and you get to meet other people, which is pretty fun. Yeah, pretty, uh, pretty wild. I know, um, interest rates, you know, affect the entire world. And now here's the other thing. Last thing I'm going to leave you guys with. This is pretty crazy. So back to the dumb waiter. If you guys have been watching this whole thing, I meant, I gave that analogy of the dumb waiter. Okay. The dumb, the me, I do the change wrong. Right now, Jerome Powell, right, is raising rates, obviously to curb inflation, fight inflation, be tough on inflation. Two things though are major right now. Number one, the U S dollar has the strongest it's been in like 20 years. We are beating the Euro, the yen, every other currency is way behind the US dollar is killing it. We have, we have created like $20 trillion and the US dollar is still, people want it. The demand is up, which is so just crazy. That's the power of the US dollar. People are like, oh, the reserve currency is dying. No, it's not. It's not dying. Look at the economic data. People, the US dollar is above euros right now. It's above euros. Okay, so this is, that's number one. Crazy thing that's happening. Number two, we have a pseudo war going on with Russia and Ukraine. You have China, and I did a whole video on China, right? Their economy, I think, is very pressured right now. I think very, very pressured. It's the reason they want to outlash and get Taiwan so quickly because they it's a huge economic boost if they can grab Taiwan. Typically, if you read any economics book, and, and Ray Dalio says this, typically economic wars are fought long before physical wars. Economic wars are long fought before physical wars. World War II, Japan was economically squeezed. They went out. Germany was squeezed economically. They went out and had World War II, right? Right now, China, I believe, is very squeezed. And this is why they want Taiwan. Now, they have a lot of debt outstanding. China is one of, they They did the Belt and Road Initiative, have over a trillion dollars outstanding. And I think it's about 10% is in default. So they've lent money to Cambodia and uh the Congo and Kazakhstan and all these countries that are not paying them back. Sri Lanka, not paying them back. Russia, not paying them back. Going into default on all these loans. Chinese companies are the most indebted companies on planet earth. They have the most debt of any other company group on planet earth. If you were Jerome Powell and the Fed in the US and you wanted to destabilize Russia and China right now without World War III, what would you do? you would fight an economic war. Maybe it's a pseudo war through Ukraine, but maybe you keep raising rates and you press that raises, a lot of times will raise rates for their currency. At least they have dollars owed back in US dollars. It raises all those rates. All the debt service is higher. It puts who they've borrowed to in default or vice versa. If they borrowed, it puts them in default. And it puts even more pressure on China's economy to collapse. Are we the idiots or are they the idiots? Now, I don't know if that's actually happening, but I'm just saying that's something that could be happening right now. They, they want to put a lot of pressure on China and Russia 
and destabilize these two communist countries. Maybe you keep raising rates. You have stricter monetary policy. You put three aircraft carriers around Taiwan to block trade. You put a trade war that Trump did with China, with China and a lot of tariffs and you squeeze their economy, which is, and then you, you let it just pop. It's this huge Ponzi scheme happening with the Chinese bubble. Again, watch my other China video. Maybe you do that if you're in power right now. Again, I don't think they're the idiots. So we got to figure out what they're doing. There's three, the three rules of investing. Don't fight the Fed. Don't fight the Fed. Don't fight the Fed. Okay. Those are the three rules of investing. This could be happening. All right. Y'all are amazing. Please like this video. If you can, it puts us up in the algorithm. If you guys can drop a comment, it just helps push it up on YouTube. You guys are amazing. I think it's fun to talk about stuff. Let me know what you think. Um, check out our other videos. Let me know comments. If you guys have other topics, I think you want to talk about. Uh, I'm Bridger Painton. Check out our links below. You guys are amazing. Please like the video if you can. I don't, I guess it does. I don't, people say it goes up. It like pushes the video up. I don't know if it does that, but anyways, I guess it does. Uh, you guys are amazing <laughs> and I'll see you guys later.